Hi, this is Sagan Bharti, and we are here at the Oracle Open World Conference, and we have once again Dim Coker. You're also known as the Linux Man in Oracle. Is that correct title, or uh, that's what they sometimes say? Yeah, but I, I'm just a Linux developer, and I manage the Linux team, so I don't really, I don't particularly care for the name. It's too much. Linux is Mr. Linux, not me. When did you get involved with Linux? Yeah. When did I get involved with Linux? I saw the email that Linus sent um, in '91, I guess where he said, uh, here's something that we put out on, 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 online and download it and play with it. So I actually saw the initial emails. And I, I think version 0.7 something, 71 or whatever, was the first one my friends and I downloaded when we were in college and compiled. So literally from day one. And it was interesting because at the time it was, um, um, you know, Stephen Tweedy and, and Alan Cox and everyone, you know, the, the original mm -hmm. gang. Some of them are still around, they're a little bit more in the background, but I still know all those folks and we used to hang out in, in Brussels or something like that. Yeah, yeah I often cool. keep meeting yeah. them uh, and, yeah. you know, Ellen Cox and all the Mad Dog. We, you know, right. on, we are still on Facebook, so we are still yeah. friends. Okay. Okay. Uh, and Linus yeah. was right when he said it will not be as big as the <laughs> project, right? Yeah, yeah, Nobody yeah. uses Linux, right? right. <laughs> Nobody uses it, that's right. Yeah, no, but it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a little interesting thing was we were actually, my friends and I were looking at BSD because at the time you could, you could send, I think it was 3000 no, sorry, $300 US to Berkeley and they would send you the BSDI tape with the source code. But that took six months, and by the time that happened, Linus released his stuff, and so we started using Linux instead of BSD. So it was, right. Yeah, so before you got vendor logged, you know, he released his code. Uh, so your involvement has been, you know, for you know, very early days. When did you join Oracle and why? I joined Oracle in 95 in Belgium, and I joined to work on the database. So my, my background at Oracle is really database, not Linux. And um, when I originally joined, hey, you know, I needed to find a job, to be honest. <laughs> I didn't really know much about databases. But, um, you know, it's an, it, it was and is an, a very interesting company. So I, I joined in 95, worked on the database side. And then in 1997, I moved here to the US to continue working on the database. And Linux was my hobby throughout the time. So at home, I would be you know, compiling kernels and, and stuff like that. But my, the reason for joining Oracle was database, actually. And, and within Oracle, how has been your evolution in terms of Linux, mm. uh, which also earned you the name yeah. <laughs> Linux yeah. man? Yeah, it's kind of, in some ways, a little bit lucky. A few things. One is, we started porting Oracle products to Linux in um, 1998, uh, in the early days. And at the time, it was more for test and development stuff. And so other teams were doing the porting of the database, but since I heard about it, I kind of helped them out a little bit, gave them some tip, uh, tips and stuff like that. And then as Linux became more in, important, I, I ended up being more involved in it as an, from an official job point of view. Then did a little side project, which was building a, a Linux internet appliance, which was something that Larry spun off as a separate company back in, in 2000, the new internet computer company was here in San Francisco. And um, that's when I became a manager, actually, because at the time that was a side project for weekends. And when this new company started, the, the agreement was that they would outsource software development to Oracle. And I hired a bunch of my friends, literally <laughs> my friends. And so we built the software for them. And then after two years, Linux became more important from a server point of view. And we shifted from building an Internet appliance to working on Linux for, for Oracle on the server side. And so ever since we've been doing the same thing really, but the team has grown and the focus has gotten more broad. What kind of team do you have within Oracle that works on Linux kernel? Well, so at, at, from, a, from a larger scale point of view, we have Oracle Linux, right? So we are effectively a full Linux distribution vendor in, in every sense, right? We have support sales, development QA, product management, partner management, everything is there, right? Every sing, single thing that, company like Red Hat or Suze does, we do too. All the different functions, training, documentation, everything. And so, so that's at large what we do for, for Oracle Linux. And then within Oracle Linux, we, we, we have a, a kernel development team, right? And that's the team that started first. Oracle Linux came after that, 2006. And so we, you know, we have a large team that works on making Linux better for Oracle. I'd say that's sort of the mission. Better for Oracle means better for servers because Oracle applications are just apps. If we make things better for Oracle database, it's also better for 
you know, DB2 or MySQL or whatever it is. Right? It's, it's standard code changes. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the, the other one, of course, with cloud, that's the server. So we, we look a lot at, uh, in, in terms of what can we do to make um, virtualization be more efficient and more secure uh, for, for cloud computing. But again, all that translates back to what you run on premises. So you don't really have to, we don't really do anything for one particular area that's not effective or also applicable to something else. So that's kind of nice. Um, but we do networking, we work on storage. So, you know, um, Derek Wong, I'm sure, right? So he maintains XFS and he works in my team. There's Chuck Lever. Chuck does a lot of Linux NFS client work. And he's one of the maintainers of the clients, right? And all the IPv6 NFS stuff for Linux was written by him. So he's in, in the team, um, Martin Peterson, who pretty much maintains the Linux Gauzy layer, right? Um, so he's in my team. So there's a lot of core folks in my group and they're actually focused on just standard upstream stuff. They don't work on Oracle Linux, they work on Linux. And in, in fact, most of the kernel team just works on Linux. It goes upstream and uh, then we pick that up in the, in, in, the production, in the production version. So one is we do development. The other one is we do bug fixing, right? We do a lot of testing. We have, nice thing with being a cloud vendor is we run thousands and thousands and thousands of servers. So when something fails, we fix it, bug, goes, bug fix goes upstream. So we have a really good way of, of making things more stable, helping, and then um, security fixes and, and things related to that. So Dan Carpenter, who I'm sure you know, works in my group. Oh. Right? So Dan lives somewhere in Africa. Right? He kind of changes countries every few years. Um, and he works out of internet cafes and he writes his static code analyzers and runs them and finds bugs upstream and submits them. So he literally has effectively no direct association with any Oracle product. He's just, you know, he's on, he works for Oracle. And, and he works for Oracle because one, he's a very good developer. He, he does a lot of really good work because fixing upstream security is important to us too. And uh, that's how Linux communities work, right? Companies hire people and that's how they all work together. So, so when we look at uh, Oracle's involvement or contribution to Linux, it's not about Oracle Linux. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's also about uh, a lot of Oracle products they run on you know, servers that may be running not Oracle Linux, sure. right? So, and that, but, but the most critical thing that I see is that I mean, everybody knows about open source that you have to work upstream. Yeah. But the whole policy is to just work upstream and then you will code, take the code and work locally. Yeah, and it, we made a bit of a different approach from um, some of the other distribution vendors. So we have this thing called, um, we, uh, uh, our kernel that we ship as part of Oracle Linux, we call it the Unbreakable Enterprise Kernel. It's a name that came from like 2006. Um, but the, the intent is, what, what we do is we refresh the kernel on a regular basis. So every 18 months to 24 months, we, we take a new upstream kernel and we release it. So a few months ago, uh, in May of this year, May of May 2018, we, uh, we released 4.14, a, a kernel based on 4.14. And so we do that on a regular basis. And, and the advantage for that of that is that we don't have to backport much. Because backporting means that what you ship is completely unique. Right? And so the developers focus on upstream. Then every two years or 18 months to two years, we pick that new version. We do a lot of testing, stabilize and fix some bugs and we ship that. And so well, typically what we ship as part of Oracle Linux is a very close to mainline kernel. Bug fixes mostly and a few minor backports of things, but in general, it's pretty much standard. Um, Advantage is one, what we ship is very similar to the community stuff too. When we find bugs, they're relevant upstream because it's not our Franken kernel, I like to call it that. And so we don't deviate by millions of lines of code. And it's a model that's worked really well for us. And it, and it makes the developers happy because in many of the Linux distribution vendor companies, really good developers spend a lot of time backporting stuff. They wrote it for upstream kernels and they have to rewrite it for an older version. They don't want to do that. They want to work on new stuff. And so most of our developers, they do upstream. So it works well. It, it helps retain people too. And, and do you stick with the, 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 the LTS release of kernel? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we have in the past not always done that. But the current one is LTS, 414 LTS. So you work with the Grex branch, not Linux's yeah. branch. Much yeah. More. Okay. yeah. Uh, and you, you talked about security a lot of time. And mm -hmm. if you look at the past two years, mm -hmm. 
there has been a lot of vulnerability. So I was talking to Linus also that what is the reason? Is that you guys are becoming lazy? <laughs> <laughs> or is it because uh, Linux has been used in so many different use cases now that it is becoming a tempting target? Or is it because uh, that uh, Linux has stabilized, there is nothing new, so people are now talking more about security. So which one of these three, or you have a totally yeah. different opinion, why yeah. so many vulnerabilities you're, you're hearing about? So it's an, that's an interesting question. So um, I, one, Linux keeps evolving at an incredibly rapid pace. So I don't think it's that Linux is slowing down. No, not at right? all. So that, that, that certainly wouldn't be the case. A lot of the really bad security vulnerabilities that have been discovered are actually hardware bugs. True. Right? So Linux wouldn't know about them until they happened. And what, what has happened is that when these really obscure hardware bugs come up, you know, one person finds it, it gets disclosed, and then there's a thousand PhD grads out there that say, oh, this is my next thesis, right? So you suddenly have these really smart people that get focused in on this, what other variations of this can happen? And then you end up with variant two and variant three and variant four in a short period of time. So I think that what happens is when, when a CPU bug comes up, there's a lot of attention from really smart people that otherwise we're looking at something totally different. So, but that's not really a, uh, it's not something that was because of Linux, right? So that's one thing. The other one is that I do think, um, I do think there's a bigger focus on, on security from the developers as well, right? And Greg Cage with LTS, that's primarily the bug fixes he does is fix vulnerabilities. And we have better code scanners out there more people are reading code and it's not like there was a vulnerability found by someone to exploit it. It was that code scanners found something and, and so forth. So so there's more awareness of it and as such we fix more bugs in that space. But I don't think there's any, I don't think code quality has gone down. I think awareness has gone up. Uh, awareness yeah. and as you rightly said most of these bugs are hardware bugs. Uh, yeah, yeah. And one thing more is that while the, the kernel community is very swift at patching things, uh, there's a bottleneck, you know, sometimes distributions, you know, especially in the IoT space, they don't even update their system. So, uh, like Greg was talking about that he patched a bug like several years ago, right. but now it became a security, so Red Hat and everybody, they're rushing to patch it. Right. So, how important is that this distribution should have a mechanism to keep it updated? Yeah, it, it is very important, actually. And, and most cameras that you buy, that you put in at home or something like that, they run an old version or a, or a router. Uh -huh. And so they need to start updating more frequently. And, um, you know, part of it is having better tools to make upgrades faster and, 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 and more convenient for these, for these companies. But there's also an amount of education that needs to happen. And I think this is actually something where the Linux Foundation can can help. And I, I do think that that Jim's kind of pushing that model. There's IoT co um, projects now within the LF, and and I think that part of that is is having more of a security awareness message too, right? So when when Jim goes on stage and talks about LF, there's all these vertical pillars, and security is is one of them, and and he kind of ties them all together. So. I think over time people will start understanding this more. And as vulnerabilities get um, exposed in a camera, they will never do that again, right? So people kind of, people learn the hard way. Um, but it's important. Um, the, the other thing that has happened over, I'd say over the last year and a half with some of these hardware bugs is that there has been a, a better um, amount of cooperation amongst the different vendors. There were some issues last year, but I think that got ironed out pretty well. And right now there's a very good set of companies and individuals, both, that, that are involved in pre-disclosure issues that we know four or five months in advance, we have time to, to fix them. The Linux vendors are on there like us. And then when it gets disclosed, we have our patches ready. So everyone works together. Sometimes it's a little bit of negotiation, but I think we're, we're in much better shape than we were a year ago. I think yeah. Spectra and Meltdown was a very good, you know, uh, wake up call for hardware vendors yes. uh, because then you have to do a lot of NDA when the kernel developers you have to yeah. separate so yeah. I, I think yeah. some lessons will be learned yeah. uh, but at the kernel level itself what are you guys doing because uh, you know there will be bugs you know mm -hmm. the software mm -hmm. to 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 find them quickly you know scanning mm -hmm. and then mitigate them before it goes to a distribution 
Are you doing anything about that? Uh, specific on security or in general? Uh, in general, in like general. Keyscope is doing a lot of work in that space, you know, right. hardening it, but... So, a number of things. You know, one is we have a lot of test suites, right? And so we actually do track upstream Linux. Every night we do builds and we run QA tests and when we find bugs, we fix them and we send them upstream. So the, the this comes back to my original comment on how our kernel being close to mainline helps. It helps us because the bugs we find are relevant upstream. So next time we pick a new version, that bug's fixed. If you run a kernel that's four years old or something like that with a lot of changes, then that code, when something happens, is probably not relevant. So you're fixing bugs and you might run into a variant later on again. So by, by, by tracking mainline closer, I think our amount of contributions to bug fixes is more relevant and, and, and better. And so my philosophy is make mainline stable and then everything else makes becomes a lot easier right okay. we have less work to do afterwards so that's that's one part the other one is you know we have a lot of tools that are some of them are in-house tools um, that we use for other products like the database we have really good code scanners they they they're great static code analyzers um, we run them on a regular basis as i mentioned earlier dan carpenter wrote you know smack and or smash or smash i guess and and a bunch of other tools and he keeps improving them every time he finds a new uh, pattern, he adds that, and then the scanner keeps running that on the upstream kernel. So, so I think that's probably the best way to say, hey, this is how we, you know, how we look at things. Yeah. Today's uh, keynote, Larry's keynote, uh, he was talking a lot about machine learning. So, uh, will you be using machine learning also to, <laughs> or you're already using it? We, well, I mean, we are from a security pattern point of view, but I think um, there are two things that, that, um, that are very useful. Um, one is, as a cloud vendor, we we have an easy way to centrally catch when the car, when the customer provides consent, of course. But if a customer VM is running and they have a kernel crash, well, we have the we have the oops. We can catch it when they have a abort, you know, like a segmentation violation type stuff. Then we can catch that, right? And so we can centrally collect centrally collect it in a big database, and then we can go start looking for patterns. Here's all these glibc crashes which application was running. Because then we can say, oh, this let's say it's Firefox, causes a specific crash. Well, that might be a Firefox bug, who knows? So, so then we can do more correlations across larger sets of systems, which you can't really do per individual customer, right? So that's one place where machine learning is becoming very interesting. Um, the other one is um, we have K-Splice, which is our online patching technology. It's specific to Oracle Linux, and, and it's, it's really cool in, in just con constantly fixing security vulnerabilities. But one of the things we're doing that, that I think is pretty unique is this. So let's say there's a, there's a security vulnerability discovered, right? If a application uses a system call and sends you know, a certain value, then you can abuse the vulnerability. Okay, so what happens? People fix the bug. If that, ver if that value, then don't do anything. Well, if somebody gets on your system and tries to abuse it after you fixed it, you don't know, right? So all these systems out there are fixed, right? And nobody knows that somebody is trying to abuse these vulnerabilities. So in cases where the pattern's very specific, our, our case splice patches that we give to customers, we now actually detect whether that value is being tried. Of course, we, we fix the vulnerability, but we send a message to the audit system saying, you know, CVE with the number is being attempted by this process ID on this server. So that way we can collect that. And so then we can tell customers, hey, if you run with our patching technology, we can actually help you figure out that somebody is on your system trying to find vulnerabilities to abuse. That's much better than after the fact saying, oh, well, we were lucky we had this fixed, but that one wasn't fixed. So that's something else that we're doing. And I think machine learning helps a lot with that. Uh, yeah. While we're talking about security, let's talk about not the, the code, but Linux in general, you know. Yeah. Uh, I always ask, you know, either Greg or Linux, and I'll ask you also that, okay, Linux has been super successful, yeah. but is there anything that you look and you worry, hey, that may screw us up, you know, something that you still think can go wrong? Go what? wrong. Um, well, it's an ever-changing landscape. Right, and, and I think a good example in, in the last few years is, so you look back at 15 years ago, not much talk about virtualization, right? 
then virtualization becomes important. First you get Zen and get Zen patches in the kernel and that causes a lot of friction to merge that in because it took a long time. And then KVM became an alternative. It was more natively integrated. And now suddenly containers become important. So now all these subsystems are changing to support containers well, right? And so that's a big evolution from just in the last 10 years. Zen, KVM, containers, and part of it is, is Kata containers where you have a little VM that has a, you know, a, a VM context that, that um, protects your container from, from other processes. So given that technology changes on a regular basis, Linux will just have to kind of evolve along with it. You can't predict that, but it's been pretty, it's been pretty consistent, right? And, and the, the other thing that I see happening is that um, complexity is going a little bit higher up the stack. Kubernetes is a good example. It's kind of the next OS. Right, Kubernetes is very popular. And, and so that becomes sort of the new way of dealing. You no longer start processes, you start pods and containers. It's kind of, in some ways, way back machine to the mainframe with VMs where each VM is a process running, right? And it's kind of funny. Um, so, so and, and Linux has to adopt to that. And, uh, you know, with cloud computing coming up, one of the changes you see happening there is that you go from, it's virtualization for the most part. However, it's multi-tenant virtualization. So while you could run multiple VMs on-prem, you didn't have to worry too much about, let's say, L1TF or Spectre, because you knew what was running. Well, the majority of new hardware and deployments are VMs in the cloud where this becomes an issue. So Linux has to be able to deal with isolation that's protecting multiple VMs from saying, hey, this is multi-tenant. So that, that's a lot of new work that happens. So there's always something new happening. I, since you mentioned Kubernetes, and there is a joke that you know, the the, the Kubernetes is Linux of cloud, but actually the Linux of cloud is still Linux. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or even yeah. if you're yeah. because you're running a server that is yeah. running Linux, yeah. or people talk about serverless, but there's yeah. a server Linux there's running Linux. Always something underneath. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, yeah. you, we yeah. talked about the security of technology. Let's talk about the security, stability, and sustainability of the community. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your concern? What is your fear? Though uh, it has been a very healthy community. If you look at the John Corbett, he comes out the report. Like uh, I think five thousand. You know, I have never seen any other open source project which has like five thousand. You know, new people ever released. Yeah. But it's still, you know. So from sustainability point of view, what's your views? You know, it's a good question, and and it's one where within the Linux Foundation, as an example, we talk about that a lot. And um, one of the concerns is that. A lot of the maintainers are more the, you know, the early folks, uh, the, the initial guard of people, and we need to have the ability to refresh some of that a little bit, and 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 have the ability to sort of nurture new developers to become, to take ownership of pieces and 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 kind of run with it, and there's somewhat of a success, right? But but it's certainly a risk. Um, you know, you don't learn Linux kernel development that easily in schools. It's a, it's a very specialized field. More, more people are interested in writing applications and having things that are pretty on the screen. Right? When you write something in, in, a, in Python or in Node, you just run it and it's easier instead of having to compile a kernel and it crashes and, you know, so it's a whole different mindset of dealing with kernel development. So one is, you know, we definitely need to find more talent. I think that companies have a large role to play in that. And, you know, there's, there's, two, there's sort of two ecosystems in play, I think, within Linux. One is there's the existing Linux people and they kind of jump around companies every now and then, right? Uh, somebody said Oracle, then they might go somewhere else or they come, come to Oracle, whatever it is. So there's, it's, um, it's a pretty small ecosystem of, of always the same people that, that are there. And then the second part is, you know, we hire college students that you know, they, they're interested in operating systems but are not yet Linux developers. So we hire folks like that, or we, we have people that might have worked on Solaris or AIX or HPOX. So there's this, there's still a large set of people that worked on Unix systems that are transitioning over to Linux and they have a lot of good ideas and, and, and background. And so we can help them. And so one of the ways to do that is to have a, a within companies to have a good way of, of helping these new developers feel comfortable in submitting stuff, right? And so in my team, when we, when we have new folks in, we follow the exact same process as, as LKML, right? So within our own team, we have a, a kernel mail list 
and somebody writes a patch and submits it for review, get patches, and we have a sign off by and reviewed by process within the company. And so when that's good, then they send that to LKML. And not that we want to, you know, validate them or be on top of them. It's that for new people, they need to feel comfortable that they send something upstream and they don't get trashed in public, right? Because that's the biggest risk we face in the Linux community, as is evident from the last few months, right? You, you want a, a relatively safe and friendly environment and not a hostile environment. And, and so I think we help by curating patches a little bit, we, we help people feel more comfortable with that. So that the base level of, oh, you have too much white space in there. And, and we even have notes. Um, this is not a secret, but you know, Dave Miller, great smart guy, very picky. Right? If you have one space too many or your semicolon is in the wrong place, you'll know. <laughs> so, so, but he has a very particular style. And so we actually have confluence pages within our group Let's say, for this subsection by this maintainer, follow these style guidelines. So we've actually, over the years, started adding that. And so when somebody new is adding some networking code, they can look at that and say, oh, I have to make sure I do this and that. So, that, so that's kind of how we help. And I think other companies do the same or have to do the same thing. But we have to, we have to hire new people. And a lot of that falls on the Linux community in terms of the LF helping. And a lot of it falls on companies because that's where most of the development work still happens. So. Yeah, and that also helps maintainers because if, mm -hmm. if you, people uh, people tend to forget that how widely Linux has been used. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these cameras that I am using, yeah. every all the Wi-Fi router, everything is powered. So mm -hmm. there is not enough scope for any mistake. Yeah. And if yeah. you look at just go to LKML in one day, I think there are hundreds of messages. Yeah. So imagine the the stress and pressure that is on maintainers. So that yeah. kind of you yeah. know that is really helps to package things that maintainer wants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you talk, you know, a lot of role of the companies. That is true because mm -hmm. the kernel community doesn't hire people, yeah. but kernel community creates an environment. Right. Mm -hmm. And you did mention that you know companies can help there, mm -hmm. but within the kernel community, as mm -hmm. you know, uh, we have seen in the pro. Mm -hmm. But Linux's rants are mostly reserved for high, you know, top level maintainers. He doesn't talk to you know. It, he doesn't see even those patches. Mm -hmm. So we have a code of conduct now. Mm -hmm. So what do you think uh, further we can do to make this environment very, very friendly for new people? Well, so a couple of things. One is um, you, you need to be able to criticize code, right? If somebody does something wrong, then you need to be able to say, hey, this is wrong. It cannot be of, oh, this is okay. It's not good enough, but we'll just add it, right? So there needs to be a, 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 a constructive way, constructive criticism, I think, is is what needs to be um, done more in, 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 in this world. And it does start with the top. Like with companies, a Linux, the Linux community, people look up to Linux. They look up to the maintainers. And so if the maintainers see a certain type of behavior, then they'll start doing the same thing. When the maintainer gets arrogant and difficult, then the people that write code end up kind of doing the same thing. And sometimes like, you know, it's this idea of, oh, they think they're Linus. Well, <laughs> first of all, it shouldn't be Linus either. People should be respectful of other folks that are trying to do something good. But you should be able to say, hey, this was wrong, and I don't want you to do it that way for these reasons, so please, next time, don't do it. Um, but, but I do think that, that leadership, like in every aspect of communities and organizations, needs to set the tone. And it's now happening, right? The, the code of conduct, with, whether people like the way that happened or not, is irrelevant. There is a there's a message and a file that says you should follow these rules, and we do that because we want to have a good ecosystem and a good community. So that's great, and 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 the maintainers and and everyone should basically follow that. And I know that it gets frustrating, you know. But one of the rules is don't hit send if you're upset, right? Come back after an hour and reread it. And, I made that mistake many times. I hit send before I should have. Um, and, um, you know, one learns. But, you know, you, you get better at it. And, and, and I think Linux, the Linux community needs to, needs to improve still. And, uh, but there is at least awareness. There are steps taken, so I, so I think we're on the right track. 
uh, yeah, Linux has actually added a filter in this <laughs> mm -hmm. mailer so that you know it blocks those words automatically. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we can uh, you know slap some machine learning also right, there. Right, so right. I just you know rephrase the whole message and make it nice. Yeah, but, but it starts with how people think. Exactly. Right? I, I do think you know. But it's important. one one thing more is happening is that uh, the the kernel community has like Ted was talking about it. There has grown so much that there are certain things that may not be appropriate in certain culture, you know, and you're not even aware of that. Right. So I think within right. uh, the kernel community, a lot of, you know, things have to happen to just become aware of that sentiment. Right. Uh, we talked about kernel and Linux and uh, Oracle. Mm. When we look at Oracle, mm. people often see a company which is not doing open source, mm. uh, which is hostile towards open source. Mm. But since I have known Oracle since Sun Microsystem days, so uh, some of the core, I think some of the biggest open source projects are now, you know, you know, uh, being led by Oracle. Yeah. So can you talk about uh, open source at Oracle? You know, I. Usually when I talk to customers about open source, you know, there's there's a couple of things that I think are important. You know, one is we're, we're, we're a very big company, right? We have thousands of products. And so what often happens is that a developer or a product manager for certain product groups goes and they talk to customers or they talk to the press or whatever it is. And they present their little world, right? This is my product and if there's an open source component to it, they'll talk about that. So whoever they're talking to walks away with thinking, oh, I talked to Oracle and this is the part that they do. So when typically when I talk to customers, I will say, here are all the things we do as a company. There's a lot of stuff out there and I'm going to focus on this thing. And I think that part of what we in some cases can do better is, is coming out saying, hey, here's all the stuff we do. So I'll set the record straight and then I'll talk about my world. And I think that will help awareness to the outside world. So that's one thing. The other one is we do have a lot of stuff, right? And a lot of very important and very popular projects, MySQL being an obvious one, VirtualBox being an obvious one, Java, of course, and, and some newer projects as well, like FN, and a lot of work we're doing um, contributing to other stuff. So I typically categorize open source into three categories. One is um, we contribute to a third-party project. Linux is a perfect example. We write code, we submit it upstream. We don't own the code. We, di we didn't write the original one, but we, we work with the community. And we do the same for stuff in Kubernetes and Docker and all these different projects. The second one is where we, we had a project that was written internally and then at some point we open sourced. Or we wrote it from scratch open source but it's really our project, right? Some of these things come out of the cloud. You know, we have SDKs and CLIs and stuff like that for Oracle Cloud. They're on GitHub. That's where development happens. That's where the builds happen. That's where the submissions happen but third parties don't really contribute because it's our stuff and we just make sure it's open source. Then you have projects like um, MySQL or, or VirtualBox, which fit that bucket of it's our product that, that's open source. And um, it's the same thing. You know, there are very few contributions to MySQL, very, very few to VirtualBox, but it's open source. So on the one hand, people say, hey, it's an open source project and, and we love it. But the fact is nobody actually contributes to it. It's ours and yes, we open sourced it, right? So that's the second bucket. And then the third bucket is where we start something, we write something, but we understand that we want it to be a, a, a generic thing that's not tied into Oracle. And then like FN, which means we create a, a sort of a, let's call it a third party hosted style project where we've done all the work, we're driving it, but we want there to be a bigger community that other people contribute to. It's hard to do that if you host that within the company and, and, and people feel like they're contributing to another entity, right? They want to contribute to something that's more neutral. So those are sort of the three different ways that I typically look at open source and we play in all three. We, when we use third party open source projects, we fix bugs, we do improvements, we submit those upstream. We follow the license, but of course we have to, and of course we do. So that's one bucket. The other bucket is we have a lot of big projects where the code is out there. And in fact, um, you know, MySQL, we, we added a lot of new stuff to MySQL, the open source thing. We made it a lot better than since, we, since the acquisition of Sun, full, fully open. Right, so everyone else benefited from that, and um, VirtualBox the same. You know, VirtualBox initially, the installer um, was not open source, 
but that meant that if Debian or somebody else wanted to package it, they had to kind of hack a build together. We said, you know, we should open source the whole thing. And so VirtualBox, we said there were a few minor things that were not, we added them and made it a little bit easier for other people to use as well. So we've done all these different, these different projects. And, and I think, you know, one is awareness of the different things we do. And if you look at the full-time, you know, paid employees on open source that, that we, we fund, it's a huge, huge group. And I don't think there will be, you know, I, I'm sure you can count on one hand the number of companies that have that many people working exclusively on open source stuff that other people can use, right? And, uh, but, you know, that's okay. You know, we're, we're, we're doing our thing. And um, I think we have a, a good recognition within the MySQL community, a very good recognition within VirtualBox, with Java, with Linux. People in the Linux community know all the work we do. So I think that in, with the actual people that are involved with open source in our areas, they have a very good understanding of what we do. And there's a lot of people out there that, you know, don't really know and have an opinion. But there's a lot of good stuff happening. And there are a lot of factors there. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. there are uh, political reasons within companies also. Right. Uh, and second is that, in general, the desktop Linux community is kind of has an antagonist mm -hmm. kind of approach towards any commercial vendor. Mm -hmm. The moment you start commercializing open source, you're the bad guy. Right. Right. But I do see that Oracle does has an image problem, the mm -hmm. same way mm -hmm. Microsoft is struggling, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with. So, are you doing anything, or you don't care about it because you know you know we are doing good work. We know the community knows it. Mm -hmm. But is it you know in back of your mind you're like, okay, we should improve that image and somehow work with the community? Yeah, I, you know we're doing a lot of. I, I think we're doing a lot more outreach than we used to. I think we talk more about open source stuff that we're doing. Code One is a good example here at the show where there's a lot of projects and a lot of discussions around the cloud native framework stuff that is happening. Um, so I think there's there's a let's say a more concerted effort across the company to have a, 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 a bigger message than, than, than sort of the isolated messages we might have had in the past. But um, I don't think it's anything where we have to be defensive of, you know, it's like show the code, right? And, yeah. and I think we do. And, um, you know, it's, it's okay. I don't think it's I don't think it's as bad as yeah. some people might think. But awareness is good where people, you yeah. know, the messaging, when people keep yeah. hearing, they're like, oh, yeah. I use VirtualBox. I did not yeah. even know it was yeah. Oracle VirtualBox. You know, uh, yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one thing on that, and, and, and that is that I think it's important to um, show the code, not just market stuff. Right. Because a lot of companies out there, they read a white paper, and then on their website, they say they're involved in that project. We don't do that. Right? If we are involved in writing code and we contribute to a project and we say we're involved in it, we don't play marketing games like that. And, and I think um, I actually prefer that model. I, I, I think we should just do the actual work and get people to recognize that versus, you know, making it sound like it and, and just have a marketing campaign which doesn't contribute. Yeah, because there will always be a, a peanut gallery. It will always yeah, scream and sure. shout, you know. Right. Uh, right. Uh, this is something you can choose not to answer, but uh, do you see? Do you think there will ever be a year of desktop Linux? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, do we need it? Because we live in a cloud world. Changing. Yeah, yeah, and desktop yeah. is changing. So my my desktop at work is Linux, mm -hmm. and I use OL which, seven. Which distribution? Oh, you use yeah, Oracle Linux. Yeah, but for me, a desktop you, you is. You don't I use have, Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't use Ubuntu. I. But all I need is an XTerm, an SSH, and you know, VI running inside. So I'm not a, and Firefox, I'm not picky. So it's easy for me. Um, you know, computing is changing, right? Um, tablets, you could argue that, that you know, Android tablets, well, it's technically Linux. Chrome, so, Chrome OS. Yeah, Chrome OS, technically Linux I today. think that's, Chrome OS is the closest so, thing we can ever have. As a desktop, to yeah. getting the desktop. Yeah, and, and so the, the world, the way you interact with devices is changing, so maybe there doesn't have to be a year of the desktop. And I think 10 years, we won't be using desktop, we'll be using all mixed reality in all those right. years, so right. I think we should build the next platform. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we talked some, co oh, uh, when we're talking about sustainability, one, one topic that mm. I wanted to check with you, if you're, Diversity. Mm. Uh, the, the the kernel community is kind of monotonous. Mm. <laughs> uh, at the same time, when we look at open source, mm. anybody can come and contribute. You don't have to prove yourself or go through a process. Mm. It's still, we don't see diversity. First of all, do you think that diversity matters? If it does, 
what should be done? No, it, it certainly matters. And and um, you know, as as an example, we in in my team we have a lot of female developers. Um, you know, th there's diversity in cultures. There's diversity in in, in in everything, and and it's important because it gives a different perspective on things. Right? It's, I think it, it's a it's a very good influence on on any project, and so um, it it needs to improve. But I think there is improvement happening. Um, it's just you know it's taking longer than than it probably should, but there is awareness, and and we certainly I know that we're doing our part uh, here. Um, to, to make that better. And I also do think that um, the behavior upstream on the current mail list to kind of tone down the rhetoric a little bit is going to help in general. Um, and, and that will help diversity too. So um, yeah, I think there's, there's improvement, but it should be hopefully accelerate a little bit. And it's certainly important. Yeah, I, I met Shoa Khan, you know, and interviewed her, and she, she has totally different opinion too. So there are people, it's mm -hmm. just, you know, we have to highlight their work, and mm -hmm. as you rightly said, it should be a more friendly environment. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, the culture plays a big role. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we look at computer games, they're all designed for men, boys, right, you know. Right, right, it's, right. So we have to change the culture where right. computer science is also for women or, you know. Right. So uh, right. we cannot just put all the blame on the community. We have to look at the society. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and schools, right? Yeah, schools, it, it, yeah, different yeah. countries have, you know, the, the, the ratio both, of, yeah, of yeah. male and female um, developers is different in different so, cultures. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's play. yeah play so it. I think we have now we have talked about a broad topic. Yeah. Let's talk. Let's stop talking about technology for a while. Let's talk mm. about you. What do yeah. you do in your free time? Don't tell me that you check L cable. <laughs> oh, what do I do in my free time? I play ping pong. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, my work is my hobby. It really is. And so I actually do spend most of my time reading technology stuff and playing with, you know, cloud stuff playing with Kubernetes and Docker in, in my free time. So it's partially work related, but it's tough. If I were to be a database developer right now, I would still be doing that. I would still be playing with Linux and everything else. So I'm kind of privileged in that I can do that work and I have a, a good team where I can say, hey, I played with this little thing for an hour and now you make it into a product <laughs> and then I can go off to something else. And it gives me the freedom to be current and, and sort of have the time to follow technology because it goes so fast, it changes all the time. So that is my hobby, you know? Linux is my hobby and in general playing with technology. I, I buy all these little IoT device SDKs and you know, have a whole bunch of Raspberry Pis at home and you know, I, not like I spend months on one little thing, I'll play with it, figure out what it can do or at least have a basic understanding of it and toss it in a bin. So, um, because otherwise you can't keep up. But yeah, that, that my hobby is, is uh, technology, so. That's yeah. the same case with me, and my wife complains that, yeah. but uh, you know, I would like, if I go to work, when I come home, this is what I, so I have an open source 3D printer from Czech Republic, so okay. I, like Halloween is there, so mm -hmm. I printed a lot of stuff, yeah. and then I use a lot of Adreno boards and a spray right. by where I made yeah. a lot of lights, and yeah, you know, yeah. talking skulls and stuff right. like that. People think that's work. No, mm -hmm. I'm that's having fun, right? I'm getting paid yeah, yeah. to live my hobby, right, and right. there's nothing better than that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. yeah so absolutely. thanks, you know, yeah. <laughs> for yeah, talking to today. Yeah, sure. And it was thanks, nice. Buddy. And hopefully we'll see you again, you know, yeah, next time. Anytime. Oh, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Take care.